And at this outcome, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Karma people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, and the, the respects to the elders past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders present here today. In regard to the webinar, I welcome you all, and I am pleased to see that it is an international meeting. We have people attending from both the New Zealand and United Kingdom, although at this time of day it will be early and it will be dark, so I thank them for their presence. Uh, for those viewing online, we don't have audio connectivity, but anybody wishing to ask a question can address that through the online web chat function that will be to the right of your screen. If we don't get your question, please don't panic and feel free to email us at sasm, S-A-A-S-M, at surgeons.org. And Nathan will get that as well, and he can submit that question. And the meeting will be recorded and posted online. The format of the meeting is we have three speakers for 12 to 15 minutes each. And at the end of it, there's 15 minutes of question time plus whatever time we have left over from our speakers. In between, if any of you feel like refreshing your <coughs> drinks, please feel free to do so as a change. And if anybody needs a restrooms, we have those to the right, as you know. And lastly, <laughs> it might sound ridiculous, but in the event of a fire, there are two points of evacuation, straight down the corridor and out the front door, or turn right just out of our door, and there's an emergency fire escape. My thanks are extended to the Department for Health and Wellbeing for their ongoing support, to Charlene Singh, Annette Van Bramer and Nathan Proctor for organising this event, to Annette Van Bramer for organising our catering, which we have all just enjoyed, and I apologise to those online, we hope you have suitable catering that side. Our presenters, Professor Madden, Professor Padbury and Dr Bhattacharya, uh, David Rossi for uh, technical support, <coughs> and the other regional audits of surgical mortalities uh, constituting the Australian New Zealand Audit of Surgical Mortality for their help and online support in publicising the seminar. Lastly, the RACS South Australian Regional Office for the help and support. So with that, I welcome you to our first speaker, Professor Madden. Thank you very much, Tony, and um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this topic, which I have to uh, <coughs> tell you is complicated and there is no easy answer. Um, I wanted to just take you through sort of some discussions about uh, the WIVL procedure, and the outcomes and volume in Australia to give you an idea of how difficult this is as a, as a topic to come to terms with, because I would suggest to you there is no simple solution certainly based on the numbers we have. Um, <clears throat> the procedure is, of course, uh, there are all sorts of hookups that one can do, and it's not beyond the wit of any general surgeon to do this operation. Um, but it's certainly not an operation you want to do infrequently. You'd like to do it in a way that you have some day-to-day -day knowledge of how it all works and the uh, uh, exposure of the anatomy and uh, the clinical decision-making. But it's not just about doing the hookup. It's about selecting the patient and it's also about managing that patient post-operatively because there's more than a few things that can go wrong. Um, so we looked at this some time ago um, to try and get a, a handle on what the world literature was telling us. And we found that um, uh, at that time, 44 papers found that increased case volume was associated with significantly improved health outcomes. Um, we also found that surgical learning curve is procedure specific and outcome specific, ranging from uh, 25 through to 750 procedures. So that's a complicated thing to apply to a state like South Australia, Western Australia, Tasmania, uh, and even, even the larger states. Um, 11 out of 12 studies found that increased years of experience was associated with significantly improved health outcomes. And that's obviously the experience <coughs> of the surgeon. And two studies noted a plateau phase where increase in years of experience were no longer associated with improvements in operative outcome. And that doesn't come as a great shock to anyone, uh, other than the fact, and bearing in mind some of the speakers we have tonight, three studies identified performance deteriorated after that plateau phase. 
and uh, Professor Padbury, I think, will deal with that a little bit later on. Um, so within uh, the operation, the lowest volume centres demonstrated a higher perioperative mortality rate, 3.5% um, to 1.3%, compared with the highest volume centres. And, you know, those percentages don't look terrible, but of course, if you realise one is 300% worse than the other, it starts to give a little bit more context to, um, to what the difference is uh, and uh, what we have to be thinking about when we're trying to wrestle with what is the right number. Um, when both index and readmission costs were considered, the per patient total direct cost at the lowest volume centre was um, 23,000 uh, odd um, uh, dollars cheaper than the other, uh, than the highest volume centres, which equated to uh, $2,263 per case. So it is cheaper to do the surgery in higher volume centres. And of course, there'll be a lot of reasons for that. So within pancreatic surgery, risk adjusted in hospital mortality very widely across hospital uh, quintiles. 6.5% um, in very high volume hospitals and 11.5% in very low volume hospitals. Um, rates of post-operative intervention required for complications and failure to rescue were lower in higher volume hospitals, um, e.g. the mortality following septic complications. Very high volume hospitals had 24.2%, low volumes were 368 So again, there is certainly evidence that higher volume does infer better outcomes. We've uh, recently, and in fact, it's been published, I think, two weeks ago, had a paper uh, accepted in the ANZ Journal of Surgery, where we looked at in-hospital survival after pancreatic oduodenectomy, and we found it's greater in high-volume hospitals versus low-volume hospitals. Um, the study we looked at here, we looked at uh, a whole lot of records. This is a systematic review. We had 1,800 records, um, and as we went through this group and screened it down, and the details are there, and I won't take you through them, other than we ended up with 17 studies we could really look at. Um, and then when we looked at the effect of volume on these papers, you can see that the forest pot showing a relatively clear move to the um, higher volume hospitals being favoured. Um, so I think that does tell us something. However, the problem comes with how you define a high volume centre. And taken from these papers, you can see that the uh, that the authors are mentioned on the left side of the uh, table, and on the right side is the cutoff for high volume centres. This is where they said after this number, we have a high volume centre. And you can see we have five, we have 11, uh, we have um, some centres claiming 40, 154, uh, 156. So this is what makes it difficult. These are numbers that have been arrived at often from looking at the outcomes that have been experienced in the, in the, in the centre at the time. And we don't know really whether we should, whether the high volume centre is five or 56. And um, that's a challenge because how do we give advice to health departments, government and uh, hospital systems if we can't even sort it out in the literature? Now, uh, in Australia, we've certainly looked at our performance, and I'm just going to show you some of the data we've obtained. One of them uh, that came out of the Audit of Surgical Mortality was out of Western Australia, where they identified that uh, at that time in Western Australia, they were running at about 16 or 17 percent mortality from Whipple procedures. And they looked at what was occurring, and they came up with some recommendations, and they introduced some decisions which I think actually are very simple. Politically, very difficult to pull off, uh, requires a lot of effort, but hardly rocket science. They thought a multidisciplinary team might be valuable in assessing the cases, which they didn't reliably have for all their cases. They thought an experienced assistant might be an advantage at the operation. Some of these operations were being done on a Saturday afternoon with a medical student. A daytime Monday to Friday surgery, given that all of this surgery is elective, not a particularly um, unreasonable suggestion. And it should be done in a major centre, uh, which is starting to consolidate this work. And when they introduced this, within almost immediately, they got their mortality down to zero. Now, it's drifted a little bit. It's one or two percent at the moment, but it's 
dramatically better than it was. And all they did was just bring in some simple rules of engagement. Now, we've also looked at um, here in Adelaide at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, where we've considered um, outcomes in a low volume specialised hospital doing uh, pancreatic epilatory surgery. And uh, this has been published. And while um, the results were obviously not as good as we'd like, we'd like no mortality, we found that um, in the period up to 2014, we had 53 cases and we had a mortality of 3.8%, which clearly is not as favourable as we would wish. And then since that uh, time, the mortality has now dropped to 2% and it's continuing to fall. And I guess this is for a number of reasons. One, it's become the volumes are going up. It's a more consolidated group, but also we're measuring it. And if you measure things, things tend to improve. Um, so, um, sorry, there's the figures. I'm looking at the wrong slide here. I've got slides everywhere. I'm sorry. Um, and then finally, um, I just want to touch briefly on the work we did again from the ANZASM uh, audit, looking at uh, perioperative mortality following esophagectomy and uh, pancreatectomy uh, in Australia. And I'm not going to talk about the esophagus, obviously, but the results, are, the results are perhaps not quite as dramatic with the esophagus. But if we look at the pancreas, at the time, you could see that Australia's mortality on the left was running at 4%, uh, which was at the higher end of where we'd like to be looking at the world results. Um, when we looked at the various states, we had um, at that time 5.2% in um, Western Australia. This is over, of course, a long period of time. Um, we had 4.5% in New South Wales. We had 2.8% in Tasmania, 26 in Queensland, 1.7 in Victoria, and 0.8% uh, in South Australia, uh, which is, of course, why I'm showing you the slide. Um, but it's, um, it does indicate, um, obviously, that a relatively small population of South Australia can generate extraordinarily good results. And I think it probably goes to the fact that it's in the hands of a handful of surgeons working in, largely speaking, two or three centres. Um, so this, I think, is a, is, a, is a concern, though, when you see a state like New South Wales, and admittedly, these are all data, I accept that, 4.5%. And we published this to try and really alert the health departments that there is room for improvement. And I'm told by my New South Wales colleagues that their mortality has improved. Uh, it's not been published, so until it's published, I don't believe it. Um, but I'm sure it is getting better, but it ought to be published. And I think it's a great shame it's not being published. Um, if we look at the admissions for this sort of surgery, it's increasing dramatically. And um, as I say, this data is a little bit old, but you can see it's increasing. And at the same time as it's increasing, the mortality has been falling. And that's very comforting. The only other thing we looked at, and again, it's partly the numbers, it's partly the volume, we did look at the uh, city versus regional, because we sort of thought that we would have um, uh, better results in the city than we got in the country. And of course, the numbers are small and all the rest of it, but the red is the city and the blue is the regional. And as you can see, there's the odd you know, leap because, of course, the numbers are small. But on the whole, we're not able to demonstrate that um, uh, regional centres are doing all that much worse than city centres on this sort of operation. Now, what conclusions can you draw from all of this? Well, first of all, I think probably low volume centres in Australia can deliver comparable outcomes to overseas high volume centres. And it's probably always going to be the way in Australia. We're never going to have 56 Whipples being done at any centre. Well, very few centres in Australia. There are probably some, but very few. Um, Specialised units at low-volume centres can replicate amenities and processes of high-volume centres. And I think Rob's going to take us further down that path. And I think that's what we need to take away from tonight. Caseload alone should not be a surrogate marker of quality. And that is clearly important. I mean, you have to know what your results are. You have to be reporting them honestly. And when they don't perform as you would expect, you need to look into why. And the policy of centralisation in Australia needs to be carefully thought out on the basis of population, demographics, outcome and cost effectiveness and utilising existing facilities appropriately. So this is a very important topic. It's difficult to get inside of and we need to do a lot more work on it. But uh, at least you can get a feel 
what the problem might look like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Madden. And for those online, we've got notification that these slides were not visible to some people, but please be reassured we'll have everything online available so you can review it afterwards, should you wish. So with that, our next speaker, Rob Pattery. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. My presentation is mainly visual, visual there's very little cognitive component, so it's quite unfortunate. Um, the business of low volume and outcome we've had to confront on, uh, well, quite often really, setting up the liver transplant unit years ago, there was a lot of resistance within Australia for us setting up. It was always stated that we would be too low a volume. And so I went on for liver surgery in general, pancreas surgery and <coughs> other initiatives. So there's quite a lot of, an enormous amount of world literature about that. And yes, the, a volume as uh, outcome relationship has been established, but it's not that simple. It's an analysis of averages. And within that analysis of averages, there are high and low performance with high volume, and there are high and low performance with low volume. Guy's already mentioned about the situation in Australia, what are the population needs and, and that sort of thing. And this is a slide I showed in England a number of years ago in a debate about low and high volume. And my statement, somewhat provocative, was there's no justification in stopping a low volume surgeon just because of the volume alone. And I toured a lot of HPB centres in the United Kingdom, which had all been sort of set up as specialist centres. There are about 33 in the UK. And the thing that absolutely struck me was that their relevance in their own minds was determined by the N. I do this many of this and this many of something else. And I thought, well, remarkable. That's what your relevance is. It's entirely defined by your, by your number, not by your outcomes. So you can see a lot of graphs that look like this. This is uh, liver transplant outcomes, where that's the, the, the volume is along the x-axis and the mortality along the y-axis. And there's a considerable overlap. Some of the higher volume centres don't have very good outcomes, and some of the lower volume centres do have good outcomes. And you can examine any procedure and see graphs <coughs> like this. This is one on coronary artery bypass grafting, exactly the same sort of thing. This is one, not a graph, but a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, a volume outcome uh, relationship can be demonstrated with the humble lap collie. And managing non-surgical conditions, well, non-operative intervention conditions like acute pancreatitis or severe acute pancreatitis, exactly the same relationship can be demonstrated. So I think it's important to try and understand what the factors are affecting the volume outcome relationship. What improves the outcome in low volume centres or what are the positive characteristics that we can identify in good outcome high volume centres and can this be duplicated in a low volume centre? Well, clearly my answer to this is going to be yes, so we can sort of stop there. So I thought the emperor needed some clothes and I just wanted to show some of our outcomes. This is um, liver, liver resection surgery at Flinders and Pancreas. The... Uh, liver resection mortality taken overall is 0.37% and major is 0.74%. Um, when, when, and both the mortalities occurred in major liver resections, one for colorectal metastases and one for HCC. With respect to Whipple, so this is now over a considerable period of time, 213 procedures, so it's probably slightly crept out of what was once considered low volume. The mortality over this last 15 years has been 3.76%. But I stress that's the 90-day mortality, not the 30-day or in-hospital mortality. And about mortality from distal pancreatectomy and total pancreatectomy, fortunately, remains at zero. This is the long-term survival in a series of patients we reported some years ago after a section of colorectal liver metastases. This is sort of in the post-chemotherapy era and our uh, five-year survival was 51%. So long-term survival also okay. And this is one of our earlier publications also looking at survival after pancreatic um, really demonstrating that for a periampulli 
pilloru malignancy, the longer term survival is better than for a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But with respect to pancreatic adenocarcinoma, that sort of international standard with a 27% five year survival. Similarly, with esophagectomies, this is just our recent order, 2019-2021. You can see that there was a mortality in 2021, giving a mortality <coughs> issue so far of 4%. But that was the first death in an esophagectomy after 237 consecutive successful cases. So um, I think we can excuse them just one. And listed there are the complications, reoperations, and some of their quality indicators such as lymph node yield and their R0 resection weight, which compare very favourably with any international series. This is the survival from our total liver transplant unit experience with a 95% one year, 85% five year, uh, sorry, three year, 74% 10 year uh, experience overall. And if we go to ERA, in the modern era, so that's from about 2000 uh, for the last 10 years, sorry, from 2006 onwards, the 10 year survival is now up to 80%. But really from the outset, when we set up the unit, the criteria in America at the same time to get funding for liver transplant was demonstrating a 70% one year survival. So from relatively early days, our one year survival was above 90% and the five year above 80. And that's just uh, indicating the numbers. Um, interestingly, there's been quite an increase since around 2006, seven, and that can be directly attributed to Kevin Rudd's initiative with organ donation. That significantly increased uh, organ transplant rates around the nation. And with respect to our reoperation rate, that's just in the last 12 months. But I think what is particularly relevant is our hepatic artery thrombosis rate. The hepatic artery thrombosis rate essentially determines survival or otherwise of the graft. And it's very, very, this is over the last 15 years since I stopped doing it, Guy, I recognise the problem. <laughs> that um, it's been 2.3% uh, in 380 odd cases. And in the world literature, it varies from 2 to 9%. So I think we can hold those results up. Um, I want to show a non-general surgical example. This is a thoracic aneurysm, an arch aneurysm. So the head, the head end is uh, at the bottom of the screen. And you can see that dreadful looking aneurysmal arch. And then it's converted into this, which is uh, a complex graft arrangement resecting the aneurysm. We're using a combination of open and endovascular techniques, and it's been a collaboration between our vascular surgery unit, which is very strong on percutaneous uh, type interventions, and our cardiac surgeons working together. And these are the sort of uh, situations they confront, and that's the these are the sort of things that they put in to solve the problem. So they've done 35 cases over seven years. So this is low volume, but it's very, very carefully planned, multidisciplinary meetings between vascular and uh, radiology and cardiac. And there's just a list of the types of procedures. And they've had three deaths in this series, uh, which comes out at 8.5%. And industry standard is somewhere uh, less than 10%. So quite interesting. I won't go through the details of this, but it is remarkably complex surgery. So Guy mentioned that I was probably going to venture into this, what are the factors affecting individual team and system? So this, what about the surgeon? Some years ago, James Reason and his collaborators published a series of articles based on research done in pediatric cardiac surgical units in the United Kingdom. This research was initiated after the Bristol Royal Infirmary inquiry. And they were able to identify within the paediatric cardiac surgical cohort a number of high performing surgeons versus ones with lesser outcomes. And quite interestingly, with respect to the individual, they identified the uh, characters, characteristics in black writing that were they could identify as being consistently present in the high performing surgeons. Now, not surprisingly, technical skill is one of them, but it's only one of eight, along with things like mental readiness, cognitive flexibility, anticipation, safety awareness, communication style. 
they had a tendency not to show stress and yell and scream and create a toxic environment within the operating theatre. Very strong team adaptation and situational awareness. I have added two other factors. I've talked about this quite frequently at other forums. I've added humility and self-awareness to this list. What about other factors? So this is a Dutch study where they did a, a, a collaborative randomising hospitals to participate versus those who did not participate. And it was essentially about regarding the introduction of a comprehensive surgical safety system involving pre, intra and post-operative factors. It was multidisciplinary and it was largely designed to promote communication. Trialled at six Dutch hospitals with five matched controls. And what they found was that there was a significant reduction in both complications and mortality in the hospitals involved in the trial. I won't attempt to, those graphs unfortunately are a little small. What about things like clinical standardisation with checklists and protocols? This is part of the culture in high risk industries. There's a book written by Ado Gawande called The Checklist Manifesto that documents this rather brilliantly. Building of skyscrapers, the nuclear navy, and other high risk enterprises, where everything is broken down into um, smaller pieces with uh, very much, very much being protocol driven. This is not part of the culture necessarily in medical endeavour, and particularly not in surgery, where the pursuit of individual excellence is, uh, is held very high, and that is regarded as the marker that will bring out the best outcomes. The evidence is not, does not really support that. Yes, technical, uh, higher performing technical skills are important, but they're not the only thing. So there is increasing evidence that embracing standardisation in healthcare is beneficial, and that is sort of part procedural and part cultural. Hepatic resection mortality, I'm just going to show a couple of examples of things here. Outcome improvement, this is a DIMIC, uh, DIMIC series. Uh, Justin Dimmick um, is well known publishing in this, this area. With a volume outcome relationship demonstrated, the outcome was improved by daily ICU physician rounds and more ICU nurses at night. In other words, the staffing at night. In another nationwide study on staffing, the tendency for higher mortality rates at lower volume hospitals, but for some procedures, lower volume hospitals with RN and RMO staffing, equivalent or better than the higher volume hospitals, had an equal mortality. So we're sort of getting down to some of the structural elements here. Um, complex GI surgery, better outcomes associated with staff experience, specialised staff facilities in the OR and the ICU, building teams. Teams not just in the in the operating theatre, but teams that extend beyond that, pre, intra and post-op. And that's uh, extremely important that we have people in all of those areas. I mean, we had to do that when we set up the transplant unit. We had some ICU guys who really took it on as an initiative. We had some anaesthetists who took it on as an initiative. That sort of thing is vital, along with the use of critical pathways and detailed management care plans. This is not new. This has been... Uh, studied and known for quite some time. This was a landmark study published in 2011, which was developed the theme of the failure to rescue. So on the left hand histogram, the mortality in high risk surgery was greater in lower volume hospitals, but the incidence of complications was not different. The thing that was different was the failure to rescue. So in the lower volume hospitals, there was not the infrastructure staffing or whatever else systems in process to identify and rescue deteriorating patients. So that becomes a critical message when we're looking to how can we do it. Once again, just a thing of that's repeated that slide. We won't, we'll keep going. Um, our esophagectomy uh, project started, we've done a lot of work in pre, post and, uh, sorry, intra and post-operative uh, practices with esophagectomies. But we started one with early mobilisation based on some work that had been done in the United States. But this involved engaging with the ICU, engaging with, with physiotherapy, with anaesthetists, uh, dietetics, to start early feeding and early mobilisation, mobilisation day one. 
And the aim was to uh, improve length of stay in hospital, but also to improve outcome. And what we found with this was that over the years, with persistent effort, we've managed to decrease the length of stay by 42%. There are a couple of studies, I'm only, there's a couple more slides and that's all. Um, this is a study that I found in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons where there was a relationship, between, they studied the relationship between hospital, hospital volume but other system clinical resources. And what they found was that as the hospital volume increased, the frequency of clinical support systems or processes was statistically more important for lower mortality than the mere surgeon volume. In other words, it was the team around, not just the surgeon. And finally, so this is a study from United Kingdom, United States, and you can see the fourth author there is Adol Gawande, that hospital board and management practices are strongly related to hospital performance <coughs> and clinical quality metrics. And in summary, what they found was that hospital boards and executives who focused on quality and quality of care tended to run organisations that had better results, strangely, financially also. And I think that could actually be a lesson for South Australia. Here we are. <laughs> this, here, I said it. Um, okay. So potential factors, just to summarise all this, explaining decreased HPV operative mortality in high volume centres, they're all listed there, but it's a combination of things. Yes, it's surgeon training, but it's staff training all around it. It's involving teams from beginning to end. It's training, it's um, the ability to rescue. It's yes, it's having technology, the availability of imaging, interventional radiology 24 hours a day. We can come up with a whole lot of factors. And then we can get down to, OK, how do we make the argument? Sorry, this slide appears to have deformatted, but we can think of it in terms of Don Obedian principle, structure, process, outcome. The structure being, being all the facilities that I've mentioned. The process, quality improvement programs, pathways, ability to rescue, with a focus on quality aligned within the organisation. And then good outcomes can then be demonstrated in low volume environments. And as I've said there, the surgeon is one, but one prognostic factor, but the decision to take on complex work in a low volume environment becomes the responsibility of the whole organisation and it ends up being a financial and structural decision, not an individual clinician one. Thank you. Rob, thank you very much. And straight on to our next speaker, Dr. Bhattacharya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Shansu and I work at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Uh, when I was asked to speak on this topic, uh, I sort of felt perhaps the best way to address this, we, we have started a very, very low volume pancreas transplant program. And I would discuss some of the thought that went behind it. And I will leave it for you to judge whether a low volume high intensity program can actually exist. So at the outset, I remember something that James Newberg, a hepatic physician who I once worked with said that success in transplantation belongs to the team, failure is that of the surgeons. <laughs> and, and this is a little unfair, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, a transplant operation involves two operations. There's a donor operation and there's a recipient operation. The metric is the recipient operation, and there are different surgeons doing both. However, starting with that, I will reflect on my journey of the last 23 years of how I have evolved into what I am today. And some of the sort of key, key moments in my training. So I started at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, in the liver unit. And that's Paul McMaster, a urologist who turned into a liver transplant surgeon and at one point ran Europe's largest liver transplant program. And as Rob said, N was a very important number on the, in those days, and I think it was about 150 to 160 transplants. 
We transplanted a 60-year-old lady, which was outside the common criteria of liver transplantation at that point of time. And sadly, on day seven, she died. I was the registrar, and Paul and I were having a chat, and he said, what do you think went wrong? And then as I started trying to think, he said, look, I'm not trying to assign blame. I want to know what I'll do different the next time round. And that's when I realized that every failure is an opportunity to learn. And missing that opportunity is probably one of the greatest problems we have. His colleague, John Buckles, was an extremely good technician. One of the finest liver transplant surgeons I have worked with. And the one thing I learned from him is do not stack up adverse factors. If you have not a very good donor, please take a very good recipient. And if you have a good recipient, you can take a risk with a not so good organ. Thereafter, I moved to the Royal Free, the Doyen Sheila Sherlock's domain, and Brian Davidson was one of the surgeons I worked with. And we were doing our first liver transplant. They were trying, trialing out the Y2K software because of the year 2000 coming in. They wanted to make sure all hospital systems worked. And just as we were about to start the top cable anastomosis in a liver transplant, the electricity went off and the backup generator didn't come on. That anastomosis was done with the aid of a torchlight. When I had walked away from Birmingham, I thought liver transplants can never be done. It needs too big a system to do it. That day I realized it can be done. It just means working out how. Sometimes there must, there is a simpler solution. The Royal Free itself was a smaller unit, did only about 40 transplants a year, but it was also one of the units which always focused on trying to use new strategies and innovative methods. <laughs> Perhaps the longest amount of time I spent in my training was with a very dear friend, who's also called Peter Friend, who was my mentor and trainer. And I had the unique opportunity of working with him when the pancreas transplant started, program started in Oxford. At the time it started, Oxford was funded only to do five transplants a year. In six years time, Oxford became the largest pancreas transplanting unit in the world doing 80 transplants a year. And what I learned there was how he created the team, how he managed the team, and how the focus on quality was so good. And he was a great leader. He is, sorry, a great leader. I thereafter went back to India and did a few transplants. And in 2008, the International HPBA Association had their meeting and uh, Derek Manis, who, was, who I had the pleasure of working with in Newcastle on time, had come down. We'd gone for a meal. He was asking me what I was doing, and I was generally talking about how things were set up. And Derek loved smoking a cigar. I mean, he sort of pretended he smoked a cigar because the cigar was in his mouth. It was never lit. But then Derek sort of said, you know what you're doing wrong, Battery? Almost everyone struggled to pronounce my surname, so he used to call me Battery. So he said, you know what you're doing battery, wrong, Battery? You're trying to replicate the NHS in India and that will not work. You have to find a local solution, and that is key. Every situation is different. We just cannot pick up a solution that works in one environment and implant it onto the other and expect it to work. 2008 was an important year for me. We did the first live donor, simultaneous pancreas and kidney transplant in India. And as you can see, misspelling my name was a universal phenomenon, even then. That was successful, however, for a variety of reasons, I chose to go back to UK. And then I worked with uh, Keith Freak, who was the then uh, president of the British Transplant Society, and a fantastic manager. And from him, I saw the art of embracing change and actually planning very meticulously before setting something off. That re results in good outcome. So when I moved to South Australia in 2016 with a view to, at some point, developing a pancreas transplant program, which was the discussions between me and my colleagues in the renal transplant service, this was the situation. For 20 years, pancreas transplants had been provided by two centers in the country, and they were funded under the NFC for the last 20 years. They were physician-driven programs. They used a standard steroid-based immunosuppression protocol, Prior to 2000, their one-year pancreas survival was 80%, and thereafter went down to 74 And in the last decade, it sort of crept up to 90.7%, and five-year survival of 86%. 
we started the program in 2018. At the moment, we have 100% patient in graphs of But we have done very small volume. So part of the path that I followed was initially to actually assess what I had to do to adapt to the local environment. And so the first thing was, what was the characteristics of the environment I was working in? We had a moderately sized medically driven renal transplant program that had been burnt with a previous unsuccessful uh, experience. There was both a lack of pancreas transplant experience within the medical fraternity and the surgical fraternity. However, we had a very supportive chief executive officer at the time. She's no longer with the Royal Adelaide now and a very supportive director of surgery. So the, one of the challenges that had to be faced was to develop a protocol, keeping in mind the local competencies, the local idiosyncrasies and the egos, because it's all too easy to be situationally unaware and think one shoe fits all. And if you're immunosuppressing one organ, immunosuppressing the other organ would be just the same. It was important to identify champions in various domains, as Rob pointed out, that uh, you do need to have lots of uh, other departments involved. And we were very fortunate to have people who engage very actively from theatres, intensive care, nursing coordinators and pharmacy. Probably the hardest discussion we had while developing the protocol was whether we had to use a line with a 0.25 micron filter or a 0.23 micron filter to give an ATG infusion. And that, that took us a lot of effort, but that was probably the hardest discussion. One of the challenges is that when you start moving from a single organ to a dual organ transplant, they, they're not the same, they behave differently. And so it was very, one of the challenges was to actually let people appreciate that this is different and there will be a period of time before people start wanting to run solo with managing these patients because it's all too easy to get it wrong. And so here's my bite-sized guide to management of all solid organ transplants. So all solid organ transplants, you can have problems that are either technical, infective or rejection. If you're in the green zone, as in you have only one of them, you can usually bail yourself out of it. It's not that hard. Sometimes it is. Sometimes if you lose the artery, it will be. But generally, if you can manage to be in a green zone, it's great. If you're in an orange zone, you're in trouble. And if you're in the red zone, it's, okay. <coughs> it's usually curtains. So we decided to keep it simple. We adapted to using an immunosuppression protocol that would have a very, very low risk of rejection, because that's what we use when we get rejection on standard immunosuppression protocol. So we went with a drug called antithymocyte globulin, which is probably one of the more powerful immunosuppressants in our armamentarium. We decided to do away with steroids because we all know that steroids impair wound healing, cause most wound breakdown. And, and then we instituted a, process, a, a practice of active post-operative anticoagulation, keeping our patients therapeutically anticoagulated for up to six weeks. And so we reduced our entire spectrum of problems that we could have with the pancreas transplant to just managing graft pancreatitis. And graft pancreati pancreatitis is something as surgeons and intensive care units, we are more used to managing than having to manage that in addition to other problems. So we, we are actually the only steroid free pancreas transplant program in the country. It took us from November to March to go through new procedures committee, develop our protocols. And from March to August, we invested in teaching and training and multiple reiterative processes so that we had everything in hand. And the program rolled out in August 2018. As I said, we have 100% one year patient and graph survival. Moving on from the one year mark, because now we are at uh, three years, one patient lost his pancreas because he stopped taking his immunosuppression. Now that's something we can't help really, but all the others are going perfectly well. Some other milestones in our, in our journey, we have used the oldest brain dead donor that has been used in Australia for pancreas transplantation, a 53 year old donor. 
we have done the first interstate brain dead and circulatory dead donor from the Northern Territory. We have transplanted someone where one of the other centers said they were too old to transplant very successfully and she's doing extremely well. We have done the first pancreas after kidney alone from a, a deceased donor from circulatory death. We have used percutaneous necrosectomy techniques to manage pancreatitis com complications or even endoscopic uh, techniques to manage the pancreatitis related complications, which is again something that other groups have not done. And we have also successfully transplanted the oldest recipient in the country, 58 years old. And so in our process, we have challenged a number of beliefs that have existed in the transfer in the in the area of pancreas transplantation. But our innovation hasn't stopped there. Classically, pancreases are implanted either entry going to the bladder, but onto the iliac vessels or the aorta and the cava on the right hand side. If it's systemic drainage and if it is uh, drainage into the portal venous system, it is usually into the superior mesenteric vein and into the iliac artery with a graft. But we have developed our own technique in Adelaide, which is slightly different from them. And we have actually, the last couple we have implanted on the splenic artery and the splenic vein, preserving the spleen on the short gastric vessels. And we have, and then anastomosing the cap of the pancreas, which is marked as DD, that's the donor duodenum, onto the recipient's stomach. And that has actually allowed us to sort of manage graft-related pancreatitis from a problem in the right iliac fossa and onto the aorta and major vessels to something that now sits in the lesser sac and something that we are more used to managing and much easier to do. We have, for now, used it in situations where a traditional implant is not possible, but we have been very enthused with the outcomes. Here is a reconstruction of the uh, I think that's the aorta, that's the recipient splenic artery joining onto the uh, Y graft, which comes off the iliac. And you have the internal iliac going on to the gastrointestinal artery here, external iliac coming onto the SMA, and this is the donor splenic artery coming down. And sort of with the eye of faith, actually, not with the eye of faith, it does actually light up quite well. That's the pancreas sitting down along behind the colon in the left sort of paracolic cutter. That's the stomach and the anastomosis goes on to the posterior wall of the stomach there. Our complications, we have had, the, so the standard of complications is that one in three patients require to take back to theater. The bleeding is occurs in about 25% patients and uh, collections and uh, infected collections around the pancreas in another 25 and our complication rates are well within uh, what's published. What's striking, however, is that we have so far had no graft thrombosis. And that that is, that I remember when we first started doing pancreas transplants in Oxford, we had six graft losses out of 10. And so I think we have made good progress here. Outcomes in terms of what our recipients feel, and I think across all metrics using the SF36 uh, domain, all patients have found improvement. So what worked? And I think what worked was protocol-based management, teamwork, very clear lines of communication, very clear definition of roles and responsibilities, a multidisciplinary approach, Reiterative learning, we tended to meet after every transplant initially to make sure that all units and all departments were comfortable. And if they had noticed anything, it came back to us and we instituted change. Audit and peer review, but most importantly, a local solution for a very complex treatment. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. <clears throat> what, you, what I'm going to do is to get Nathan to provide the questions, and you're welcome to stay in your seats and relax. 
because we're using the audio system, or you can step out if you wish. We'll ask the questions to the audience at large. I'm sorry you're going to be looking at an empty screen because I can't stand here and get the questions from Nathan. So we feed it in this way. <coughs> I have to say to our speakers that the one thing that struck me uh, very importantly is the emphasis that speakers had on non-technical skills. And I know this is a subject that has been raised in the College of Surgeons and in the Australian New Zealand Audit of Surgical Mortality as to the importance of non-technical skills. And I'm intrigued that you've highlighted that. So excuse me while I get the first question and we'll proceed. It's not to say that people here can't ask questions either. Just one, sorry. We have one question so far. <coughs> I'll read it out. Can't see figures, but seeking a comment on outcomes of benign versus malignant with increasing numbers of patients presenting for pancreatic surgery. Many of these have IPMN or neuroendocrine tumors, etc. And short-term outcome, even the historic series, is better in the benign group. I don't want to take an issue. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a question. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yes. I mean, I don't think we've, uh, I, I haven't, all of our data that I was presenting, of course, was based on mortality. Um, and uh, certainly the mortality is uh, very much largely represented by adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. In, in, work. Um, in fact, I can't actually, I don't think we actually know what the um, pathology is of the um, deaths that we've had in the vast majority, in, in, in the group as a whole, because that's not, necessarily recorded in the order of surgical mortality. I mean, we'd love to have all that information, but of course, it's um, it's already we get pushback on the level of data we provide. But I think the comment is correct. I mean, you're going to need to look at things other than mortality, uh, to look at the value of volume or not on more on less um, morbid interventions. And so uh, you know, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas is going to have a, a poorer outcome than, say, a neuroendocrine tumour or, say, a, um, a removal of a, a mass that turns out to be benign, uh, all of which happens. Um, and we need to look at morbidity. The trouble with morbidity data at a general statewide level or national level is really difficult. It's incredibly expensive to collect, and I don't think it's going to happen in, in my lifetime. Uh, but we can collect aspects of it. And, of course, you could do it, and we have done in South Australia, collected that sort of data on sort of sentinel operations uh, from a number of centres. But doing it at a national level is very difficult. Um, Robert, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Well, only, we, had a, we had some benign cases in our series, and their survival was much, much better. But the thing that uh, we hate operating on soft pancreas with non-dilated duct and with some of the benign conditions, that's what you get. Although, with cystic disease that involves the main duct, that may not be the case. That's much easier. I mean, we've sort of started to lean to a bit towards doing total pancreatectomies now as well. Um, they're much easier because you don't have a pancreatic intestinal anastomosis, um, and people are very good at managing diabetes. But, um, but look, by and large, that it, the benign indications represent a rather small proportion at the moment of the, of the whole. And our experience with IPMN is not the same as you see in European and American centres where they're doing large numbers of them. We are extremely conservative as a, as a country with IPMN, and I think we should continue to be so. Thank you. There's another question that's come up. How many patients are borderline resectable and had neoadjuvant therapy? Um, some. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, it's a, it's a really vexed question because the, the benefits of neoadjuvant therapy have not really been demonstrated, well, haven't been, haven't been demonstrated at all. And so, uh, but in terms of the numbers, I haven't brought, I don't know. I can't answer that. Thank you, Bess. Can I just take this next question? I'll take questions from the floor. What are the thoughts of the speakers on making outcomes of different centres available publicly as occurs in the NHS? 
I think that would be an excellent idea, um, and I see no reason why that shouldn't occur, um, as long as the public understand what they're seeing, um, which is, of course, a bit of the challenge. And I'm not entirely sure it's... Uh, I mean, I think it would be useful to start with large public institutions first, and then maybe head towards uh, the larger private, and then maybe get down to the very much smaller ones. I think it has to be a, a graded experience, but you know, certainly in the UK with cardiac data and in America and New York particularly with cardiac data, it made a difference. And um, uh, that's one of the reasons we published the Anzazam data on uh, Wiffle's procedures mortality was to at least alert health authorities and maybe the interested public that there were differences and they needed to be looked into it. They may all be explicable, but they need to be looked at. Okay. <coughs> Um, just looking at the screen, I'm going to change the format. I think it's audio visual uh, communication is probably going to get, be better. So a question from the floor, and I'll ask the speakers to actually stand at the podium. Gotcha. Um, the question. Yeah. Um, so in go podium. Go. Me and you. Um, <laughs> you can have both. Please ask the question. Uh, 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 I'm Harsh Kinnear, one of the uh, surgeons at QVH and Royal Adelaide. Um, just uh, in local context, do we then think that rather than volume, we need to have guidelines around systems, um, surgical expertise and non-technical expertise in place to be doing these complex procedures? Um, I, I, I personally, you know, from my experience in South Australia in the last 16, 17 years, um, I think all centres that perform these complex operations do a fantastic job and I think what we have here are low volume, high quality centres with facilities and teams that are available to be able to pull this off. So what's your thoughts on that? Should we be using volume? Um, well, no, I don't think I don't think volume is something that should determine whether or not you actually do it. But what I think there should be is an institutional commitment and the institutional commitment to provide the resources to actually do it. So it becomes an institutional decision to support it and therefore they have a responsibility to make sure there's interventional radiology and there's all the, you know, 24 hour CT scanning, there's ICU, people on call, all that sort of thing. That there's no point in this, <coughs> this day and age an individual clinician or even a few clinicians trying to set up a, com a complex service without that commitment from the institution. So that's how I'd frame this. So, Rob, how easy has it been for you to gain that institutional support for things like robotic surgery, for example? <laughs> yeah, very loaded question. Um, thank you. Um, so I think the thing about uh, the, the robot is that hasn't been our major burning deck, but I would like to gain robotic access for surgeons in the south and they, traditionally that hasn't been uh, quite as straightforward. Where I think there's a problem with that is the equity of access question and so there's not equity of access for the population of South Australia, it all depends what your postcode is and I, and I can't support that position, whatever, you know, robot or no robot, whatever it is. Rosen, why don't you stay there and uh, trust my need to contribute. The next question is, the UK and the USA both have one hepatobiliary unit per 1.6 million people. SA, as an example, has three hepatobiliary units per 1.7 million people, in brackets, plus multiple private hospitals, similar in most states. This is not specific to hepatobiliary, but almost all high risk slash low volume surgery we do. The question is, our set up better than theirs from a patient perspective? <coughs> I don't know who sent that question, but thank you very much. It's appreciated. Um, the problem with the United States and UK is the special, the designation as a specialist centre is based on cancer resection. And that's it. That's the thing that determines the specialisation. And so the people with acute pancreatitis and the humble gallstone, particularly in the United Kingdom, get a really rough deal. So the, the study trip I did through the UK was at the request of their upper GI association to look at the effect of uh, the cancer designation as the thing that determined an HPV centre. A 
and what effect that had on managing benign conditions. And I was absolutely horrified. In fact, they would save far more lives by getting severe acute pancreatitis into a specialist centre than to getting Whipples into a specialist centre. Just by improving the survival from severe acute pancreatitis from 5% to 4% would make far more difference in terms of uh, lives, lives saved. The performance with respect to gallbladder surgery was frightening. And quite honestly, that, you know, I, I believe unacceptable. In Australia and New Zealand, the HPV surgery covers, comp covers biliary. And it's not necessary for an HPV surgeon to do all gallbladders, not at all. But it is at least uh, contingent upon us to provide the training, um, the process and monitor outcomes and provide a backup for complex type procedures. So I think our aim in setting up the ANZ HPBA was primary, first was to establish an expert biliary surgeon. And then we would have add-ons from there, liver, pancreas, and transplant. But it was the base, biliary surgeon was the base. And that's completely different from the other continents. Has a question from the floor. <coughs> Rob, uh, sorry, just thoughts. I'm going to try and steer this away. Oh, you want me to come back? Just enjoy it so the audience can see. Don't go away, Rob. Um, James Moore from the Royal Adelaide. I'm going to try and steer this away from a hepatobiliary masterclass. I'm interested in the timing of this. Why has this question come up right now? And uh, are we seeing the dead hand of the department? starting to want to move some of this sort of work in certain directions? Um, I don't know, but maybe Tony and Guy, sorry, I don't know the answer to that. I'm actually quite an innocent speaker in this forum. We <laughs> 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 may be able to provide the answer. Yeah. Well, look, I, I also don't really know the answer. I know certainly our Department of Health is interested in looking at ways in which better outcomes can be achieved and within the limited resources we've got. And, I guess that um, trying to understand the factors that affect outcome and whether they'll be fixed by making a mega centre of um, Whipples somewhere, um, whether a, a mega centre of liver resection somewhere is going to uh, suddenly change the overall outcomes for South Australian patients is the sort of question they're wanting to understand. And I think that we are people in a position to give that advice. Um, we sort of understand what we don't know and we can certainly, uh, we're lucky in this state particularly, tell you exactly what we do know. We have really, I mean, Rob showed tonight, he's, he's tracking his outcomes. We certainly are tracking our outcomes. And so we're able to talk uh, very well about how, how our patients fare under the system we currently operate. Um, interestingly enough, some years ago, and it is a few years ago now, Rob, we published um, our results with you, where we actually lined up the Flinders liver results and ours, and they were almost as good as ours. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think that's the agenda, um, uh, James. I think I think we've just got to be careful that they have the right information if they're going to make decisions, rather than having, uh, you know, a, a paper from uh, the United States, which is often based more on marketing than it is patient care. I think, well, if I could just. Uh, pipe up at that point and just say uh, the greatest good to the greatest number and uh, you know we're, there's a bit of a focus on high risk low, high volume low volume but we do far more, more lap collies far more right hemicolectomies far more you name it more kidney stones that hold up and cost the department more money than any of this so I think the sort of common sense advice that we just had from Rob uh, about his experience in the UK is critical in being fed back. Uh, thank you. It was a complete eye opener. Mm, um, sure. I couldn't believe it. it I, and it was it wasn't even hidden. It was so obvious. But everyone was so obsessed with being, you know, doing more pancreatectomies or more livers or whatever it was that the great masses with all the other conditions were completely lost. In fact, the most number of um, HPB surgeons did in the in a one year period eighty cholecystectomies out of thousands. I mean, you know, wow, there were 
vascular surgeons, renal transplant surgeons, the new model acute, so all sorts of people. The, the operative angiography rate was 9%. The bile duct injury rate was, was unacceptable. I mean, it was something. We have another question. Uh, one critique of low volume cancer surgery is that patient selection trends towards low risk oncology and patient comorbidity patients. The results are better due to the lower risk, but cancer outcomes are worse for the community than they might be if high risk were taken on. Do any of the speakers have a comment? Thank you for that question. Um, we've done a lot of examination of exactly that question. So for our liver resection experience and colorectal metastases, we benchmarked ourselves against Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And the proportion of our extended hepatectomies, lobectomies, segmentectomies and local resections was almost identical with almost identical outcomes in terms of survival and margin positivity rates. So we were very, we were very reassured by that. In terms of pancreatic cancer resection, I've benchmarked down numbers statewide versus the numbers in the UK, and it compares very favourably. I've compared the liver, so the, our liver resection rate for colorectal hepatic metastases on a population basis with Holland, and they were something like 43 per million, and we were 30, per 100,000 rather, and we were 40, uh, sorry, 39. So pretty much the same. And I did a, very, a comparative study with our liver transplants based on <coughs> MELD score, which is the, a, a measure of severity that we use for allocating organs. And our series, the MELD score was 22, and the published, collected, published American series was 21. So, and we hadn't given any uplift for tumours or whatever. So as far as I could tell, with those various benchmarking exercises, we are doing very similar things to international good standard. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Um, please have done. I took a photograph of one of the slides just so that I had the information at my fingertips. And if someone were wanting to start a centre or start uh, an area of interest in a topic or in a field that was going to be initially low volume. Um, that person had good technical skills but wasn't mentally ready. The cognitive flexibility was questionable. Anticipation skills as we look at people at an interpersonal level was again questionable. The communication style was pretty dictatorial and dogmatic. Um, didn't work well as, as a team member um, and certainly lacked humility and self-awareness. Now, this is to be indicated as the opposite of what creates excellence. Now, if we see this in a developing situation, what is the role of management or department heads in dealing with that situation? And it borders, I guess, into non-technical skills and the relevance of that in allowing centres to continue. Comments from the speakers, please. Well, despite all that guy, you still managed to continue. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Do you wish to answer that? <laughs> so what you're describing here is a nightmare. Um, and look, uh, I mean, you're essentially describing a, a person on the spectrum with significant psychopathy, and they're extraordinarily difficult to to deal with. But it is an important problem. Excuse me, interrupting, Rob. If you you're head of the surgery department, if you as a head have someone developing an interest, how on earth does one control that? We've seen this developing in various. Okay, departments. it's a lot easier to to do something when it's at the beginning and you know the, the thing is the, the thing is to not employ someone if you have a suggestion of those sort of characteristics but unfortunately my personal experience has been that you tend not to realize it until later and once pe you know people are very good and psychopaths are really good at hiding stuff and they they know how to do that and 
it does it's not until much later that it starts to come out and then you think you know how the hell did i miss that but um you know i've been caught a few times and it's it, once once it's got to that point it's it's really hard to uh, to deal with um the idea is to try and trap it before it starts but that's not not easy I've been caught with that before, and I remember going to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. I just said, um, they have a program for um, educators. And in this conference, they had 40 educators there. This, we all introduced ourselves, and this, the second speaker raised us as a topic, and so did all the other 38. At the end of the week's course, they were asked, well, exactly this question, how do you handle it? And various suggestions came up. And the one that really intrigued me most of all is the person said their centres sorted it out. They have uh, applicants from throughout the states, and so they invite them to come the night before and meet the residents. They provide uh, all the drinks, and they mm -hmm. let them have a really good time to relax, and then they have the meeting the next day. After the meeting, they bring the residents to ask their opinion. And they find that they have a far greater insight into what I guess they were describing as the non-technical skills or the other aspects of uh, applicants than otherwise. It's totally illegal, but I did find it intriguing. <laughs> so on that note, I thank all the speakers. It's been a fascinating talk and thank you for attending. Thank you to our speakers and thanks to all Nathan and everyone who's contributed. Good evening.